Right, there we so go. I haven't even really technically started, so that's fine. <laughs> um, so yeah, so if you can hold off drinking all the whiskeys until until uh, I until I get us there, that would be fantastic. Um, so like I said, I will race through this history as much as possible. Um, but it does make everything make much more sense when we get to the tasting section. Um, so we're going to start off uh, with um, the, the beginnings and the, the history of Japanese whiskey. And the great thing about Nikkei is the history of the Nikkei brand is also the history of Japanese whiskey. Uh, so you won't just be learning kind of getting a brand presentation this evening. It, it is very much about um, Japanese whiskey as a whole. Um, and we'll be comparing it to some sort of Scotch uh, styles as well. Um, so uh, here's a beautiful picture of Japan, just in case anyone is missing traveling. Um, I'm starting to shove in lots of uh, <laughs> nice pictures and maps for everyone. Um, but we're going to start off with this guy. He is Masataka Takitsuru. And um, if you haven't heard of him, he's the guy who came to Scotland and learned how to make whiskey and took it back to Japan. So he's known as the father of Japanese whiskey. Now he was born um, to a family of sake makers. they have been making sake since the 1700s. So if, I'm not sure if everyone's had sake before, but it, you can describe it sort of simply as Japanese rice wine, although there are millions of rules about how to make it, millions of types, and it's very, very complicated. So um, that might be insulting if we sort of described it like that. Um, but um, his family making sake, so for a long time and from a very early age, he knew how to make alcohol, how to taste it and how to get different flavors from different production methods. So it's very much in his blood. Um, now, as a young man, his dad had actually earmarked him as the son that he wanted to take over the family business um, because he had such a good palate. Um, it was a bit controversial though, because he was the third son in the family. So not the one that you traditionally give your business to. Um, but unfortunately for his dad, he wasn't that interested in sake because about uh, 40 years before he was born, foreign alcohol started coming into Japan. Now, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, but Japan kept itself very closed off from trade with Europe um, up until the 1850s. They'd seen what had happened in the rest of Asia and the rest of the world, which is the Europeans turn up, do some trade, pretend to be nice, and then accidentally take over your country. And the Japanese were not having it. Obviously, it's not just the British at this stage. It is obviously the Spanish, the Portuguese, the French, the Dutch. Everyone's at it. Um, and so in the 1850s, the Europeans had got out of the habit a little bit of taking over other people's countries. And so Japan thought it might be sort of safe to open up to trade um, with them. So obviously when there was no trade with Europe, everyone in Japan was drinking Japanese made things. Um, and so if you wanted some booze, you'd drink sake, uh, but that's more of a civilized thing to have, have with food. Um, if you wanted to get a little bit more tipsy, a little bit more quickly, uh, you drank something called shochu. And shochu is um, the Japanese distilled spirit um, whereas sake is just fermented like wine. And um, it is, um, it's made from whatever is kind of, uh, kind of predominant in your local area of Japan. So for example, in the north of Japan, there's lots of sweet potato grown. So this shochu there is made from sweet potato and every crop all the way down Japan to the south where you get some made from sugarcane. So that's what the Japanese people had to drink. And so that's what they were used to. And in the 1850s, suddenly European things start coming in. So we've got wine and we've got whiskey, but of course it's all traveling in by boat. It's in teeny tiny quantities and it's very, very expensive. So very much aimed at the emperor and his friends, the other kind of upper, upper class sections of society. Um, but everyone heard about it and it became a huge, huge trend. I mean, anyone having anything European was just seen as super cool in Japan at that stage. And so if you knew someone who knew someone who knew someone who tried some whiskey or some wine, you were way cooler than all your friends. And so the Japanese very quickly noticed, you know, there's a huge demand and there's a teeny tiny supply. So you do what you would obviously do is you try and make your own. Uh, now, the early Japanese whiskies were not really whiskey. Um, they just took some shochu um, and they made it brown by coloring or put some kind of barrel chips into it and put the word whiskey on the front. And that was early Japanese whiskey. And everyone knew that it wasn't real whiskey because they could see that it was made in Japan. Um, and they knew it didn't taste the way it was supposed to, but it was close enough and it was still seen as European and, and exotic and exciting and, and, you were, and very, very cool. Okay. So Takitsuru is a young man. This has all been happening for a couple of decades by the time he's, um, he's an adult. And um, he gets really interested in the differences between the 
the faux whiskey being made in Japan and the real stuff that's being imported. And so he, rather than uh, going into his father's company, he joins Japan's biggest alcohol import company. So only dealing with foreign alcohol. And he's working on wine, he's working on whiskey. Now he manages to talk with them about building Japan's first proper whiskey distillery. Um, they realize that the stuff being imported is super expensive. They don't see why it couldn't be made in Japan. And they realize that there's a huge market for it still. So this has all seemed like a great idea. So they sent him to Scotland in 1918 so that he can learn how to make whiskey. Um, and this next picture is one of my favorite. It's one of the ones that they show at the distillery. Actually, they have a museum about the, the history of Japanese whiskey. And uh, this picture has the caption, Takitsu arrives in Scotland. <laughs> Hopefully everyone recognizes that. It's not too far from the club. Um, <laughs> it's uh, like, they're like the same, same, same. Uh, so um, he, he arrived in Scotland in 1918. He enrolled in Glasgow University because actually it's the same now as it was then. Best way to get a visa uh, is to, to be a student. Um, and so he starts writing to distilleries to get some work experience and try and learn how whiskey is made. Now he did actually manage to work at uh, three different distilleries while he was in Scotland. Um, and the first one, we've got Glasgow University sort of um, in the middle pin there, but the top left picture. The first one he works at is on the top right um, in the Speyside region, Longmorn Distillery. I'm not sure if anyone's ever had a Longmorn before, they're delicious. Um, but he learns there how to make single malt whiskey. So obviously about, you know, he, they grow barley in Japan, but they don't malt it. Um, they do a whole bunch of stuff with, um, uh, with koji, uh, which is a whole different process. So um, he's learning how to malt barley, um, how to do all the separate stages of producing whiskey up at Longmorn um, and how to make single malt up there. Now, after that, he then gets some work at Boness Distillery, which is one kind of bottom right. Um, not too far from Edinburgh, actually, uh, and you probably won't have heard of this distillery, um, and that's because it actually closed down in the 1930s, and it's also a grain, it was a grain whiskey distillery, so you're not going to find any old vintage single malts from a Boness distillery, it's also called William Calder, um, and it would have all gone into blends, but there he learned how to make grain whiskey, um, which is a very different process, um, and, uh, you know, really sort of adding to his notebooks. He took copious notes in little notebooks that Nika still has. If you go and visit, uh, which I strongly recommend you do uh, when we're allowed to travel, um, then uh, you can see Takitsuri's notebooks at the museum at, uh, at one of the distilleries. So he learned how to make grain whiskey. Then the distillery he spent the longest at is Hazelburn on the bottom left uh, there in the Campbelltown region. Um, and Hazelburn, different from the one that's there now, it was the original one. Um, he learned how to make a different style of single malt from up on Longmore. And obviously, Speyside and Campbelltown styles are really, really different. But also at this stage, Campbelltown has got tons and tons of blending happening, as does Glasgow. Uh, so he's also learning how to blend. OK, so he spends a few, couple of years there learning how to make whiskey, taking all these notes. Um, but he's a busy boy. He doesn't just work at distilleries and study. He also courts while he is there. And so he meets this lovely lady called Rita. And she is the elder sister of one of his classmates at university. Um, and they have, um, he's, they've invited him around to the family home, technically apparently to meet the younger brother who's being bullied at school. And Takitsu offered to teach him jujitsu. But I feel like um, he was probably just invited around to everyone's house uh, because he was the first Japanese person to study in Scotland. So that must have been a massive deal. So he'd be like, come around to my house for dinner because it's really important. <laughs> you have to. Um, so anyway, he met Rita, um, obviously he explained to her his idea about making, uh, making whiskey in Japan and um, they, they, they got together and then they married in, in 1920. So neither family was delighted, unfortunately, at the time. Obviously interracial marriage in Scotland was pretty rare, um, but in Japan it was even rarer and neither of the parents um, kind of were very, very pleased initially. Uh, they did, they have a very happy marriage and the parents and families all uh, came around to the idea after a little while um, but a uh, kind of amazing love story for anyone who felt like they needed it for this evening. Um, so late 1920 Takitsu takes his new wife back to Japan um, and obviously the plan is to build a single malt distillery. Now the problem is that the Takitsu's company that he was working for had really been affected that happened um, by the recession that happened after the first world war and I'm not sure if you've ever thought about it, but building a whiskey distillery is not a great thing to do 
if your company is a little bit low on cash. Um, you, you need to obviously buy tons and tons of expensive equipment and then wait years and years and years for the bloody stuff to age. So it's very much not a, a fast way to make money um, if you're a business. It is not the best business plan. So uh, his company is no longer planning to make um, build a whiskey distillery. They say we might do it in five, 10 years, but we're not going to do it now. Takit Siru has caught the bug, though. He will not accept his old job back. He uh, only wants to make whiskey. So he starts looking around in Japan for anyone who might have some spare money um, and be interested in making whiskey. And this is the time when actually most people start the history of Japanese whiskey. And for me, it never really made sense because I was like, why <laughs> and how and, and what's going on? So hopefully what I've just explained helps you understand why uh, people were, were desperate to make whiskey in Japan. This demand is still there. Um, you know, almost a hundred years after European things start coming in. And even now, anything European is seen as cool um, and, uh, and exciting and exotic. So it's, um, it's still a part of that. So Takitsuri meets an old family friend, a guy called Shinjiro Tori. He's the guy on the left. Um, and you might have heard of him before because he's the guy who sets up Suntory Whiskey Company. Now, Suntory Whiskey Company are actually now the third biggest spirits company in the world. So they've done very, very well. But initially at that point, they weren't called Suntory, they had a very different name. And Shinjiro Tori had been making some of the fake whiskey in Japan. He hadn't had great success with that, it wasn't very good. Um, but what he had had a huge success with was another fake European thing. He made something called Academy Port Wine. It was neither port nor wine, okay? It was sake, colored and flavored to look like a European thing. And then with those nice European words on it, um, but in a recession in Japan, if you're making a cheap product that's part of a huge trend, um, then you're obviously going to make tons and tons of money. So he had done, and he'd actually been planning on building a whiskey distillery in Japan. He'd been advertising in Scotland for a distillery manager to move over from Scotland and set up a distillery. Um, no one had replied. I feel like they believe it was a real thing. Um, and he hears that uh, Takitsuru who's from a well-respected alcohol producing family from Japan has been in Scotland learning how to make whiskey. So he employs him on a 10 year contract to design and build and run Japan's first proper whiskey distillery. Like I say, they were making whiskey before that. Um, some of that whiskey might have accidentally been made from barley, but it wouldn't have been fermented um, using yeast. It would have been made using this sort of more shochu method, which is very unusual. Um, and then maybe or maybe not age. So whether we can call that kind of whiskey or not, we generally don't, okay? So this is going to be Japan's first whiskey distillery. So they joined together in, uh, and they start working together officially in 1923. And so this is the sort of start of Japanese whiskey production. Obviously we've only got a couple of years until the 100th anniversary. So I feel like it's gonna be lots of exciting things uh, happening in a couple of years. So these are great plans. This is super exciting. We've got a guy with the knowledge and we've got a guy with the money. Um, now, unfortunately, things start falling apart quite quickly because they both have very strong ideas about what type of whiskey they want to make. Now, Takitsuru, obviously, he's been to Scotland. He wants to make super traditional style Scottish whiskey um, in Japan. Um, he's got a Scottish wife at home, so she wants it to taste like home. Uh, where Shinjiro Tori hasn't been to Scotland. He wants everything to suit the Japanese palate. He knows that you need to make it taste suitable for the Japanese palate. And also he's thinking about, you know, where to build this distillery. He knows that shipping uh, liquids around Japan is an expensive thing to do. We need to keep the cost down um, for the sales price. So he decides that he wants to make the whiskey, let's say as close to some of the biggest cities in Japan as possible. Now Takitsuru's got a completely different idea. He's like, no, I've been to Scotland, the climate, the landscape, the water are all really important aspects of the type of whiskey you're going to make and the resulting flavor. So they start off arguing almost immediately about where to put this distillery. Now, here's a wee map of Japan. I'm not sure how many of you know it very well. Sorry, just move my legs. Um, and when I first looked at this and read about this argument, I was a bit like, well, I mean, it doesn't look like too much to argue about. The place that Takitsu wants to build is that star up in the north there on the left uh, called Hokkaido. Um, that's the island of Hokkaido up in the north. Um, and uh, Takitsuri thinks the climate here is just like Scotland and will be an ideal place to make whiskey. Um, Shinji Rotori, however, says there's no people living here to ship it to the mainland and where most people live. So Tokyo, Kyoto, further south, Osaka, all those cities further down there. Um, it's going to cost tons and raise our price. It's a silly thing to do. I want to build the distillery where that bottom star is. Hopefully you can see 
uh, just south of the P in Japan. Um, and um, <laughs> Second Zero thinks this is a dreadful idea. Now, like I say, when I first used to, I used to look at this map and be like, well, I'm a British person from, uh, from an island country. And when I look at other island countries, for some reason, I'm idiotic. I quite often think it's the same size island as we are. So I was like, well, if that top, I, top star is, say, Scotland, then the bottom star is like, you know, north of London, Birmingham kind of area, which obviously is not at all correct. Islands have different sizes, guys, just in case you hadn't <laughs> realised that Australia is another great example. Uh, if you if you want to be sure so started looking into this and actually realized that if you overlaid japan um onto europe if you put that north bit in scotland uh that southern bit would be as far south as northern spain so just to give you an idea of how far that is obviously therefore how different the climate is the water the landscape and of course the resulting whiskey so takitsuru is not keen on building the distillery down here but he is the employee so you just kind of have to do what he's told. And he does manage to search around a wee bit and up in some hills. So it gets a bit of altitude in there, which brings the temperature down a wee bit, um, manages to find a lovely valley. Um, and it's called the Yamazaki Valley. And in 1923, they start building Japan's first whiskey distillery. I'm sure you've all heard of it in the Yamazaki Valley. That is the Yamazaki Distillery. Okay, so Takitsuri designed it. He built it and he ran it for the first few years. Um, him and Shinjiro Tori there, their disagreements just carried on from there, to be honest. Takitsu realized quite early on that for him to make the type of whiskey he wanted to make, he was going to have to set up his own company. So he saved up during this 10 year contract. And then in 1934, him and lovely Scottish wife Rita move up to that northern star up there um, on the island of Hokkaido, the area that he thinks is perfect for whiskey making, and start their own whiskey making business up there. Everyone doing okay so far? Good, sorry, we are mostly through the history, but not quite ready for drinking yet. So if you can just hang on a wee sec. Um, so 1934, Takitsuri builds, starts building his own distillery. Now, again, even though he's been saving for 10 years, he still doesn't have enough money to just build a whiskey distillery and not have any other money coming in. Um, so he sets up initially a juice making company. They start making uh, fruit juices. Apple, plum and pear trees are all grow really well up there. Um, so it makes lots and lots of fresh fruit juices. Rita is also helping. She's teaching English and teaching piano to the children of wealthy families in the area. So just trying to keep money coming in while they gradually buy bits of distillery or build bits of distillery and end up with some whiskey. They released their first whiskey in 1940. Um, so obviously not a great time for releasing a new product. Um, it's the middle of the Second World War. So not great. And actually uh, it had a bit of an impact on the the new burgeoning whiskey industry in Japan because there was a shortage of barley, um, obviously as shortage of food as there was all around the world in different areas. So um, the Japanese government did exactly what our government did um, at this stage and rationed things. And if you were a business that was making something that was not food out of something that could be made into food, you were told to stop. And they classed whiskey as not food, which I think of horrifying. Um, luckily, our government didn't do, <laughs> didn't do the same. Uh, whiskey was seen as quite important over here. Although some distilleries, I think, did close down a wee bit. Um, luckily, um, and the Yamazaki distillery did actually have to close down for quite a few years because they couldn't get any barley. Luckily, the, the Nika distillery, Takitsuri distillery, didn't. And this was through Rita. She had met the head of the Japanese Navy by teaching his children um, and explained to him that the reason the British Navy um, was so powerful was because of that wee splash of rum or whiskey, she might have gently lied about that, um, that they got every day. And so um, the head of the Japanese Navy decided that his sailors needed a little splash of whiskey every day. And so he negotiated with the government for the Navy to get some barley ration, which he swapped with the distillery um, to keep them going, okay, for whiskey. So if you'll excuse the pun, the Navy kept the, the Nika distillery, a series distillery afloat uh, during the very difficult time of the Second World War. So we question from Elliot, did he split? Yes, that's exactly right. So Shinjiro Tori was left running, a Yamazaki distillery had to find a new manager for it, um, having taught him how to make whiskey. And then he left and set up his own distillery up in the north. They actually were not friends from then on. And even now uh, the Nika company and the Suntory company, unfortunately in Japan, are very big rivals, even though Suntory is tons, tons bigger. But it's kind of like a Coca-Cola, Pepsi situation. Uh, and um, actually in Japan, uh, Suntory has Coca-Cola and Nika 
has Pepsi as part of their wider companies. So, um, so yeah, they're seen as rivals. In the UK, we all work together quite well. And um, I know the guys at Suntory very well. Um, and we work together, we'll do tastings together. Um, and we try and promote Japanese whiskey together. But in Japan, uh, you know, there's beers and there's uh, all other spirits associated. So if I go to Japan with the Nika trip, for example, and I order the wrong type of beer, it's very, very unacceptable. Um, so yes, it's all um, still a big rivalry, just in case anyone wasn't sure. Um, so what was I saying? Yes, they kept afloat by the Navy. Okay, so after the war, and obviously the war um, and the war uh, ended, and it was a very difficult time for everyone, of course, not just the rationing. Rita was technically an enemy citizen because uh, she was British. Um, and so that was a big struggle for them as well. But they managed to survive. And after the war, this is when Tackett Siri starts thinking about the type of whiskey he really wants to make. And we're very close to tasting whiskey now, guys, I promise. Um, now, what he wants to make is blended whiskey, which seems a bit weird nowadays because what we all want to make and drink quite often is single malts. I'm not sure if we've got any single malt snobs in amongst the group. Um, I feel like probably, <laughs> um, but um, yes, in those days, blended whiskey was king up until uh, the 19 sort of 60s and 70s. If you were wealthy, well-traveled, well-educated, you drank blended whiskeys um, because they were consistent. They had a brand name, so you could travel to London, Paris, New York, um, and you'd order this whiskey and it would taste the same, okay? Whereas if you were poor and lived in Scotland, you drank the local single malts and it was made in batches, so it tasted different every time. Um, and also it didn't have a brand name, which is named after the nearest valley or river or whatever. OK, so that all flipped around in the 1960s and suddenly people started drinking single malts, exploring different single malts for the flavor profile of that particular place and distillery. Um, but when Takit Siri is doing all of this, that's all before uh, this happened. So he very much when he learned about whiskey in Scotland, blends were the cool thing to do. Um, and of course, blending also appeals to sort of his Japanese sensibilities like balance, harmony all those kind of things, making a, a balanced flavor. So um, he wants to blend. Now he's built himself one distillery, uh, which obviously it's a wee bit hard to make a blend from that. What we do in Scotland is you buy whiskies from different distilleries in different regions and you smush them all together and you end up with your blend. Um, he could do that. He could have bought whiskey from Yamazaki, his old distillery, but as I mentioned already, they are not friends. So he's not going to do that. Now, the other thing you could do is import whiskey from Scotland, which is obviously madness it's quite expensive it's still difficult to get across and really really hard to do although it is done nowadays okay so what he decides to do is start making as many different flavors of whiskey as he can in his one distillery now of course this is, happens in scotland but it happens you know from distillery a next door to distillery b they might make different decisions during production so peated barley unpeated barley for example is a decision obviously then if you peat your barley there's different levels of peat to it what yeast strain you use for fermentation, how long you ferment for, your distillation settings, and the type of casks you age in, just to name a couple, will all have a huge impact on the type of whiskey you're making. Now, most distilleries in Scotland had one answer to most of those questions, so that their style was kept very consistent. If you wanted a different style, you went to a different distillery who'd made some different decisions and different answers to those questions, okay? So Tackett Siri started changing. So Monday, I'm going to use unpeated barley, yeast strain A, uh, distill it using these settings and stick it in the next bourbon barrel. Um, Tuesday, however, I'm going to use lightly peated barley, yeast strain C, ferment it for this long and stick that in an ex sherry cask. OK, so we've got all these different options. And obviously, if you change all the, one of these permutations every time, he actually ended up with 600 different whiskies at his one distillery which was massively overdoing it, to be honest. There was only a few hundred distilleries in Scotland at that point. So him ending up with 600 different options was, was madness, okay? But he was quite thorough and he quite enjoyed it, I think. So the other thing that you need when you're making a blended whiskey, and we are at the point of tasting, guys, well done for not falling asleep. I can't see any sleepy faces, so that is pleasing. Um, is, uh, he needs a grain whiskey. Now we're all going to grab uh, the Nika coffee grain, it should say on your label. Yours probably won't look like this. Well, Very unlikely to be pink. Um, but mine is, uh, mine is here. This is what it looks like. And he starts making some grain whiskey as well, because obviously when you make a blended whiskey, you need to add grain whiskey to malt whiskey. So he's got loads of flavors of malt whiskey. And now he used to make a grain. I remember he learned how to make a grain at that Bowness distillery near Edinburgh. Um, 
So he he has the know-how. He doesn't have the equipment. And so he actually brings over a type of still in the 1960s that he worked on in Scotland. And it's old still called a coffee still. And that's why the word coffee is on this whiskey. It has nothing to do with the bean or the drink, just to be very, very clear. Um, for anyone who is excited about a coffee flavored whiskey, nope, sorry. <laughs> um, and the word coffee, hopefully here you can see, is spelled differently. Uh, and slides oh, I'm skipping forward. We'll get back to some of that, don't worry. Okay, so this has got EY on the end, and it's actually an Irish surname. Um, and it's named after an Irish dude who patented this type of still in the 1830s. Now, before him, pretty much everyone was pot distilling, which is how single malts are made, but it's inefficient, it's time consuming, it's expensive, and it gives you a big punchy flavor, which is great if you want to drink it on its own and you age it long enough. But if you don't, then it's a bit too spiky, okay? Whereas what this type of still did, it made things cheaper to make, easier to make, Okay, um, much less time consuming to produce some uh, high strength spirit, but also it makes a lighter bodied flavor and it makes things smoother. It comes out smoother already, less need for aging. Okay, so um, things can be just a little bit softer, a little bit gentler. Now, when we make a blend, we mix together the light, soft, smooth grain whiskey with the big, punchy, intense single malt, and that's how you make a balanced blend. Hopefully, everyone's with me so far. I'm sure you're all. Okay, about blended whiskies. So he ships over in the 1960s two coffee stills. Um, and a coffee still is not the same as a modern column still, guys. A coffee still is only if you've used uh, Mr. Coffee's original design, which is two columns, a certain number of plates, a certain way of working. Um, whereas modern column stills, hardly anyone uses coffee stills nowadays. There's a couple in Scotland, um, but most of your grain whiskey distillers in Scotland are using big modern column stills because they're even cheaper to run. You can get a computer to be in charge of those. Super efficient, okay? And extreme, you know, a lot more columns, a lot more rectification happening. If anyone knows how to separate, you know, oil that you get out of the North Sea into various components, this is the same, same process, okay? Um, so it is, um, that's why they put the word coffee on the label. It's important that people know it's a coffee still. However annoying it is to me that everyone thinks this is coffee flavored whiskey, it is important that everyone knows it's a coffee still and not a modern column still. Okay, because they, it gives you a lot more flavor. Modern column stills are more efficient, which means less flavor. Coffee stills, medium efficient compared to a pot still. So you're getting a medium bodied flavor here. So hopefully everyone's got this whiskey now sorted. I'm waffling on about stills. Sorry if you're not interested in stills. Um, I, we'll talk about them a couple more times, I'm afraid, but um, hopefully it will make sense as we taste things through. Um, so this whiskey here is made from 95% uh, corn, sweet corn, also known as maize. Um, and then 5% malted barley. And the barley is just there for the enzymes, obviously to convert all that starch into sugar, same as you would do in a single malt, but you're just using a wee bit here. Um, and then it's distilled in a coffee still um, and aged for an average of 12 years in used American oak. And it's 10 to 20 years old is the wider age range. It doesn't have an age statement, but it's, um, uh, we've got vast majority uh, here is uh, 12. Now, just in case you are confused by all the waffling that I just did, um, here's a nice comparison here of um, a column still versus a pot still. So you might have been to a distillery and seen a lovely, sexy, copper, curvaceous uh, pot still. I love them. Um, <laughs> I like licking them, um, but don't do it when they're on. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think you can taste the whiskey <laughs> when you're at a distillery. You're like, I'm getting a little advanced taste. Yeah, quite hot. Don't do it when they're on. Um, so I usually give them a, a gentle poke first and then decide. But um, yes, so on the right hand side is how you make single malt whiskey. And you have to, if you're calling it a single malt, you have to use one of these. Okay, you have to do a batch distillation process. Whereas when you're making grain whiskey, you could use one of these, but you'd be very unusual because remember they're time consuming and expensive. You will mostly use one of the things on the left. And grain whiskey in a blend is usually thought of as the cheap, flavorless, kind of crappy bit. Uh, that you don't talk about, okay? Whereas uh, single malts, you, you go to, maybe go to a, a tasting for a blended whiskey and they go on for ages about all the malts that they use and not mention the grain, which is the majority thing in there, okay? Um, that's a bit less in modern tastings, luckily now. Okay, so this one is distilled in a coffee still, so it's quite light, it's quite easy. 
And then, like I say, it's aged for an average of 12 years in those used American oak casks. So hopefully on the nose, everyone's picking up some flavours. Sorry if you finished it already. I'm trying to get myself to the tasting section as well. Um, but on the nose, I predominantly get initially is the American oak. So butterscotch, vanilla, toffee, any of those flavours are classic things to come from American oak. And actually as a cheat for future tastings, if someone like me says it's aged in American oak, then you can just yell out vanilla and you're done for the rest of the evening. You have contributed and well done. Okay, so um, vanilla. Um, the other things that American oak quite often give you is coconut. So if anyone's getting any coconutty nose are coming on here, that's um, coming from the American oak. And also American casks are quite often charred on the inside. And so what you'll end up with is like a slightly burned toast flavor. It's definitely not smoky, if you like smoky whiskey, but it's definitely got a hint of that kind of burned toast flavor as well, all right? Don't worry if you're not picking up all these flavors on the nose, you'll get some more in the palate. And um, I'm just saying a lot of words so people can sort of anchor onto something wherever, wherever they kind of get. Then for me, the things that come through next are flavors from the corn. So corn initially, really classic tasting note is buttered sweet corn. So think of butter, the texture of buttered, and you know sweet corn, popcorn, all that kind of stuff coming through uh, from a corn-based whiskey. Um, and then also corn quite often will give you citrus. So think of lemon peel, marmalade, all those kind of things, and tropical fruits as well. Okay, so if you're getting any of those, good work. Don't worry if you're not, take a little sip. Now, I'm not sure if this is your first neat whiskey of the day. It's like, that's what the time is. But it's too late if it is, so <laughs> you should be ashamed. Um, but uh, take a tiny wee sip if it is your first neat whiskey of the day. It's 45% ABV, um, so it will say hello. Um, but it's also then, once it's set hello, it's super smooth on the palate. Uh, so hopefully uh, you'll all realise that. And you should realise how much lighter this is than a single malt. And I'm going to assume that most of you drink single malts majority of the time. Uh, so someone's tasting coffee. Yeah, it is a bit psychosomatic. Um, yeah, let's try and stick to burned toast if we can. You can head to sort of roasted coffee. That's OK. Uh, it's another flavor that you can get from American oak. Um, but yeah, it's a very a big pair of suggestion. A lot of people say they can smell the coffee. I don't drink coffee, but I can smell it and I don't get any. But I'm, I'm a bit past it. <laughs> Okay, so we're good. We've got butterscotch and hints of vanilla coming through. So yeah, classic American oak flavors. Green banana, brilliant. Those tropical notes, fantastic. Um, now, what I want everyone to pay attention to as well is not just the flavors. Don't stress about typing in a flavor if you're not getting any, just tasting whiskey-ish flavors, it's fine. Um, but can everyone try and focus on the texture? Even if everyone tastes different things, quite often I find texture to be almost more universal than uh, flavors. So. Feel how this spreads across your tongue. Feel how it clings there. Even once you swallow and it feels quite light, you can still feel it stick into your, uh, in a bit of an oily, buttery kind of way for quite a while after you've swallowed it. it. Reaches the roof of your mouth as well. Again, like an oil would, it kind of spreads across. So hopefully everyone can feel that. And that's very much what a coffee still and corn is bringing uh, to, to this party, okay? Now, if you distilled corn in a modern column still, you wouldn't get that texture. You wouldn't get so much flavor, okay? Um, and obviously, the thing about coffee still is if you're distilling different grains in it, you're going to get different flavors, whereas in modern column stills, you don't. You're sort of stripping the hell out of them, essentially. Okay. So obviously, carry on letting us know if you're getting any other flavors coming through. It will develop. I kind of joke about this whiskey um, is that it's super light and easy to drink. Um, it's very, very smooth. It tastes of burned toast, butter, and marmalade. So this is breakfast whiskey, and I'm sure a lot of brands have a, a breakfast whiskey that we'll try and talk to you about. But quite often, I think, you know, some of them, you're like, no, no, if I had that for breakfast, my day would go in a very different direction. Whereas this one, you're like, no, no, I could, I could continue uh, with a day. It would, you know, you still need it to be sort of a, a very special type of day in emergency uh, for breakfast whiskey. But I think this one is the one you want to grab. Um, it will go, go <laughs> really well. And again, that kind of buttery corniness. I mean, imagine with cornflakes. That's the one. <laughs> so uh, lots and lots of flavor here. So can everyone see how it's light, but has lots of flavor? Yeah. And you might not have drunk many grain whiskeys before. Like I say, they're not often talked about. They're not seen as very sexy. They're not seen as very expensive and things that you want to collect. But they are a really interesting style of whiskey. And I think if you're thinking, you know, I'm usually a kind of big, heavy, peaty whiskey kind of girl. but you know, on a, on a hot summer's afternoon, maybe not 
kind of where I want to go. And this whiskey actually would give you sort of a lot more drinking occasions. Um, also, if you've got a mate that you're trying to get into whiskey, maybe they already drink rum, maybe they drink bourbon or other styles of whiskey. This one is a great sort of stepping stone into that. Okay, so um, it's, it's a really easy way to sort of start getting into whiskey flavors without too much kick in the face. Very, very smooth, very polite whiskey. Apricot's very good. So that's kind of your, linking your citrus and your tropical fruits together, um, getting apricots. So really, really good. Um, it's a yellowy whiskey. I'm not sure if anyone tastes yellowy, <laughs> if anyone tastes colors. Um, it's a thing that some brains do. Um, but yeah, for me, I'm getting all sunshine. Uh, and you know, that color of when you cut into a pineapple, uh, that kind of color, this whiskey. Okay. So I'm going to let everyone enjoy that for a wee bit while I then start talking about the next whiskey. Now, don't stress out. We don't have to chin this one. I'm going to give you a little bit of time um, while I carry on the history, but I just managed to get us to the 60s. Um, so, uh, yes. Now, obviously, as I mentioned, um, Takitsu's plan is to blend. So this is a really important thing that he needs for that. He needs his grain whiskey. It's going to be his base. And the reason he chooses to use a coffee still is because he wants a good base. Now, it is, of course, possible to make a good blend from a kind of cheap, unexciting, um, bland grain whiskey. You can make a good blend from that, but it's a bit harder. Whereas if you've got a really nice grain whiskey, um, making a delicious blend from that is much, much easier. So this is why Takitsuya goes to the bit more of the extra effort, the extra expense of having a coffee still rather than a modern column still. Um, and also it's what he learned on in Scotland. So Scotland's kind of getting rid of those stills and he can pick them up nice and cheap um, as well. Um, and he knows how to work them. Okay, so it's definitely, like I say, they've put that word on the label there, confusing though it is, because it's a thing to, to be proud of. And it's a traditional kind of heritage type of still basically. Okay, so we're gonna talk about blending real quickly and we don't usually do the tasting in this way, but we have a bit of a newer SKU. You might have tasted this one um, last year, it was released two years ago now that we're in 2021. Um, but for me, this really talks about why blending is amazing. And if people have maybe been a bit sort of dismissive of blending before, or um, like I say, been a single malt snob, hopefully this will help a wee bit, uh, help everyone understand all the different complexities that blending will bring. So the next whiskey we're going to taste is called Nika Days. Um, and it is a blended whiskey. And it is predominantly the whiskey we've just tasted. Okay, so the whiskey we've just tasted is the main component in this, but it's also the lightest component in this. Now, as well as the coffee grain in this, this also has uh, single malts from two different distilleries and another grain whiskey that Nika makes, but they make it on the coffee stills using malted barley. I'm not sure if anyone's ever seen the Nika coffee malt. It's got kind of an orangey label, mustardy orangey kind of color compared to this one, but looks like this one otherwise. Um, and that is another type of grain whiskey that you can make again, so that they've got more flavors, a, a wider range of flavors for them to blend from. Okay, but this is Nika Days right here. Um, kind of, I can't, uh, it looks like Easter, I think. Uh, <laughs> very, um, very bright, very energetic, uh, very happy to see you. I think um, that's the box. Yeah, it reminds me of um, like an egg, you know, get old kind of, I remember the artists, but um, kind of, yeah, well, like modern you... art, <laughs> modern oh, art, yeah. egg. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this one's 40%. So we're going down a wee bit in ABV. Um, and it's actually a wee bit younger as well. It's 10 to 12, sorry, 8 to 12 years old, this one. Um, and, but, it's weird because it's going to be lighter in flavor because it's lower in ABV, but it's also going to be more intense in flavor because it's got single malts in it. And remember, single malts are more intense, more punchy, more powerful than grains. OK, so the grain that we just had is the lightest component in here and everything else is adding layers and layers and layers on top of that. So if you give it a smell straight away, we're getting kind of raisin, getting a bit more apricot, maybe we're getting some kind of honey, nutty flavors. There's a tiny little hint of smoke in here. You get a little hint of kind of coastal seaside action. Uh, there's lots happening, a lot of chocolate, chocolate orange and stuff as well going on, okay? That's uh, so getting lime, absolutely. So tons more flavors. Hopefully everyone can feel that, all right? And I'll give it a wee swirl. It's only 40% ABV, so really not gonna burn yet. It's just, um, 
going to open up, okay? And then give it a little taste. And what you should feel is the coffee grain of being all buttery and coconutty in the middle of the palate. And then all these other flavors layered above it and beneath it. Okay, so it's the central part. And this has got tons more happening. Sweaty socks. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to say that's coastal. <laughs> Earthy, maybe. Yeah, so tons more happening here. Um, and hopefully everyone can feel that, okay? So can you feel how it's got a little bit more oomph at the front of the tongue? And that's coming from those single malts. Remember, they're more intense. Now, this is lower in alcohol, but because you've got more oomph coming from those single malts, you're going to have a lot more kind of um, intensity of flavor. So it's quite funny. Some people's palates aren't sure how to differentiate sometimes between... Um, flavor, strength and alcohol or strength and flavor. And this is a really great way to work out that if your palate thought this was stronger than the last one, your palate picks up flavor rather than ABV. And if your palate thinks this is weaker than the last one, uh, it's because your, your palate focuses on the alcohol content in the, in the liquid. Okay. So yeah, banana, very good. Um, lots and lots of flavors. Is everyone getting that tiny little hint of smokiness as well? It's not tons at all, but it's just like a little sprinkling uh, right at the back of the palate. But lots of honey uh, going on. Yeah, there's a super citrus note coming. I think it's chocolate orange as well. Yeah, lots of flavor. And yeah, it is still, it is a light blend. There's a lot of blends that are much more intense than this and that are designed to last a long time. And again, if you're a single malt drinker, this will feel still quite light and with a shorter finish, you're quite right here. But um. Of course, that's what you're trying to build. You're trying to build a sort of roundness of flavor that is complex. It's got lots and lots happening, um, but it's not designed to sort of, you know, go on for ages and have you pick it apart and do all kinds of stuff. So it's, um, yeah, hopefully everyone's understanding all the different things that you can do with blending and the difficulty, uh, you know, comes in making it balanced every time um, between the sweeter notes coming from, say, a, a cask that's been aged, you know, using sherry casks, um, coming from a, a PT, malted barley, all those different options that we kind of talked about earlier. Okay, so lots happening. Um, I'm actually still tasting it quite a wee while after, um, but it sort of loses specific flavors after quite a while. It's just taste of whiskey, yeah, a whiskey flavor um, towards the end. Okay, so hopefully everyone's, everyone's getting this one. Now, this one is actually designed a bit more for mixing. Now, in Japan, the vast majority of whiskeys that are drunk are blends. And the vast majority of uh, blended whiskies that are drunk are drunk mixed. Um, so it used to be tradition in Japan with lunch, you'd go um, and you'd get lunch and you would also order what's called a highball or a mizuari. Now, mizuari is a bit more traditional. You get a tall glass, you fill it full of beautiful big ice cubes. And their ice cubes from the supermarket are crystal clear and, and quite large, whereas obviously ours are little scrabbly things. Um, so bars would do it kind of hand cut ice. Um, do a double measure of whiskey in there and then twice as much water and that is called a mizuari and that's your standard way to drink whiskey and actually the funny thing um, in Japan is whiskey is thought of as a refreshing summer's drink okay you go to Japan on a cold winter's day they don't think let's have a whiskey that's when hot drinks and other things come out okay but in Japan on a hot summer's mid-afternoon 3 p.m you know oh my god so hot need a refreshing beverage they are straight away like oh whiskey what no, in Scotland, whiskey is for warming us up. <laughs> what's, what's going on? Okay. So um, yeah, exactly. Happy hour, that time after work until many hours after. Um, I think the thing about the highball is well, you sort of stay hydrated while you're drinking it. So kind of feel like you, you maintain your drunkness level, but you never get that kind of hideous thirst that you also get when drinking other things. So lots and lots of uh, highballs are, like I say, Mizuari is still water. If it's a really hot day and you want extra refreshment, then you use fizzy water and that's called a highball. Okay, so if you use anything else that's still, so like coconut water is quite common, cold green tea, uh, that is a type of mizuari. And if you use anything else that's fizzy, so ginger ale, for example, that is a type of highball. Okay, so it's, um, it's loads. And yeah, absolutely. This whiskey is designed to be mixed into highballs. This is how the, the kind of average Japanese person would drink this one. Okay, so nick of days it's suggesting a little bit lunchtime um uh, kind of or all afternoon um and like i say those refreshing summer's afternoons uh, it will go down an absolute treat okay so 
hopefully everyone's understanding that. But the, the way of making them is all right. There's a lot of awfully complicated things on websites about stirring at 12 and a half times clockwise and this and that and the other. It, you don't need to do that. Just make it like you'd make a gin and tonic, okay? So a double measure of whiskey and then twice as much water or whatever mix you're using um, on lots and lots of ice. Um, doesn't really need a garnish. Uh, whiskey shouldn't really have a, a garnish. Um, and it wouldn't in Japan, um, but you sometimes see bars in America and Europe doing a slice of lemon, which I object to. I don't know. What do you guys do, George? Do you um, do you garnish a highball? Do you ever get asked for a highball? No, I think the only garnish I ever did, I did a peated whiskey and I had smoked bacon on top. Nice. I would definitely approve of that, then that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, think, yeah. I don't, I don't think whiskeys need garnish, do they? I, I, I would be of the opinion that it's wrong. <laughs> When I learned cocktails um, quite a long time ago now, there was very much whiskey never gets the garnish. You know, so there was all kinds of rules that you had, you know, uh, lemon with gin, lime with vodka, which one with um, slimline tonic, which one with normal tonic, etc. There was rules for everything. And yeah. whiskey was no garnish. And Apart I approve of that. You know, old fashioned orange, and that's it. Fine. Yes, absolutely. And that's part of the cocktail. And that's why I think about a highball is lemon is not part of the cocktail because the garnish isn't just a for looks it's for, it affects the flavor so um anyway <laughs> so hopefully everyone's understanding this whiskey i think i think if you're into whiskey obviously it is super light if you're a single malt drinker it's uh, maybe you know not uh, as intense and powerful to your taste but hopefully you can everyone see as an easy drinking uh thing um then this is a an amazing little blend and i think um blends are often talked down they're very much coming back now mixing in things into highballs and mizoares is very much coming back in now my granny always drank whiskey and soda um, with two ice cubes. Uh, and she always did it Japanese proportions, actually, which I realize now. Um, but, you know, that kind of went out. We're the ones who changed. We taught Japan how to drink whiskey like this. We then changed fashion. We moved to single malts. Uh, we changed. They carried on drinking whiskey the way that we'd shown them um, and then are still doing it. So it, it's us that, that moved over. And fashions, you know, drinks do have fashions as well. So it's coming back. Um, so yeah, hopefully everyone's enjoying the Nika days and seeing how much more it's got than the coffee grain. Yeah, well, we'll definitely have this in the bar was, uh, for some Mizanaras. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, yeah, I, think, yeah. um, I think the coffee the coffee grain in the freezer on a nice summer's day would be amazing. It's really good. And actually, I love this one with either coconut water or elderflower, um, elderflower presse. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. Um, and it's weird because for me, elderflower is a summer flavor, whiskey is a winter flavor. And then you put these two together as a highball and it's outstanding. It's really um, good price as well. This is 37 quid. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Um, so, yeah. Um, all right. Let's move along now. Um, so everyone's had two whiskeys. Hopefully we've all relaxed. We are now launching back into the history. Um, and so... Where we got to is the 1960s. So Takitsuru has got his first distillery up in the far north. Remember, he's making 600 different styles of single malts um, from just changing the different production processes every day. Um, and he's also now shipped over some uh, coffee still so he can make his grain whiskey. Now, he's all good to make blends from here. And he does start. But unfortunately, the th problem is that first distillery that he's built, remember, it's on an island next to the sea. All those 600 styles that he makes there all taste a little bit islandy or coastal. <laughs> and he's like, ah, oh, I really need something that's a little bit more spacey or highlandy or lowlandy even in style. And he can't really make that at this coastal island distillery. It's a little bit hard, uh, no matter what options he, he plays with. Okay, so he decides he needs to build himself a second distillery. Now, by this time, he's got a bit more money. He's been making some whiskey. Um, he's been... Um, you know, successfully uh, making whiskey and making things for quite a while. Obviously, that contract with the Navy lasted not a long time. So this second story that he builds is much more modern, uh, much, much bigger, um, got a lot more of essentially all the mod cons of the days. So this is 1969 we're talking about here. Oh, there's a picture that I was meaning to show you earlier. Um, so first distillery, remember, is up on that North Island on the left. Uh, we'll get to talking about it into more detail later. Um, but the distillery we're talking about just now is this one further south. Okay, so you can see about halfway up on the right hand side of Japan, um, where the arrow is going to. And this was established, like I said, 1969. So after you've been making whiskey for a wee while. Um, and it's in the Sendai province. So it looks like it's near the sea there with that dot. It's really not. It's about an hour and a half away from the sea. 
really, really windy roads up and down um, hills uh, in what would look really like a highlands kind of area. Okay, so loads and loads of beautiful hills, forested hills, um, tiny wee windy roads. And I, you know, logistically, a dreadful place to put a distillery, really. If you're trying to ship in barley and ship out whiskey, <laughs> uh, not big roads, not really suitable, um, not not like Shinjiro. Do I remember him focusing his distillery sites on where he can get, you know, access to the people in the big cities very easily. This is not that place. Um, but he actually chose it because he wandered around Japan for two years, tasting rivers like a madman, um, until he found a river with water that reminded him of Scotland. And that's where he built the distillery, okay? So Takitsuru, I'm going to say, like, if we're comparing Nika and Suntory, Suntory were set up by a really good business person um, who then sort of took all the ideas, all the Takitsuru's whiskey knowledge, mixed it with Japanese spirits knowledge and Japanese palate, et cetera, and made a thing that would sell really well. He kept the price down, business 101. Takitsuru, however, not focusing on the business side of things, very much trying to make whiskey in a traditionally Scottish way whether that makes business sense or not hopefully that uh, hopefully everyone gets that okay so you know like i say suntory now the third biggest spirits company in the world they bought jim beam a few years ago so they own i mean parts of mccallan they own uh lefroy they own the more they own Ockentoshin. there's tons more okay they own midori and orangina um my favorite things <laughs> so uh, lots and lots going on whereas nika not one of the biggest spirits companies in the world, actually now owned by Asahi. The family that set up Asahi was close friends with Takitsuru's family and, and um, invested in him at this stage of the business, building Miyagikyo. Um, and so when Takitsuru died, Takitsuru Jr. died, um, the business was sold to the Asahi family, but they won't change it um, because it's you know all related to that historical relationships. It's not like a big business taking over another business where they cut half the staff and change all the production processes and all that kind of thing. This is very different from that. Yes, don't, don't mix those, um, but a great selection of uh, selection of products. Okay. Uh, Nika does own a distillery in Scotland. Ever anyone apart from George and let's say Elliot as well want to guess? Um, I don't have a prize, I'm afraid. But if anyone wants to guess um, that the distillery that Nika does own in Scotland, you're more than welcome. I think I see some other familiar faces Good on this. Good man. Yes, well done, straight away. Has someone been to a tasting before? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or do you just know? <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, Nika owns Ben Nevis in Scotland. So if anyone's been up there, um, it's uh, it's an amazing tour. It's really the oldest video I've ever seen um, at the beginning of the tour, but brilliant whiskey. Um, so yeah. Um, anyway, let's move along. Where did we get to? Oh yeah, so Takitsu building himself his second um, company. Um, so he sets up this site. Now it's it's called Miyagiki. You might see this word in the top left of the slide. It's a bit of a bugger to say when you first see it. And hopefully everyone get grab the bottle that says Miyagiki. You can have a bottle that says that on it if you haven't poured it already. Sorry, I'm behind. Um, now the cool thing about it is if you struggle to say it, uh, then just remember um, Karate Kids. And obviously we have what's it called Cobra Kai happening at the minute, uh, which is a great reminder. Um, but Miyagi is the name of the valley. Okay, so if this whiskey was made in Scotland, we called Glen Miyagi. Okay, because Glen means valley as well. So um, Kyo here means valley. So this is the Miyagi Valley. So if you're not sure how to say it, remember the lovely old karate teacher and say Miyagi Kyo. Okay, so ideally in Japanese, each syllable would be the same length, but European people were rubbish at that. So um, you know, do the best you can. But uh, you are ending up for Miyagi Kyo. Okay, Miyagi Kyo. Um, so, remember this distillery is designed to replicate space ID or Highlandy style. So, I hope everyone can see this picture now. It's, um, it's absolutely beautiful, really, really green. And in the middle of this valley, there's no other buildings for miles and miles around. Um, and the, <laughs> I was joked that when I first arrived there, um, it looked even more Scottish than this because it was raining so hard I couldn't see any buildings. I was like, yeah, this is the correct place to fit a distillery if you're looking for Scottish style uh, kind of climate. Um, so it's inland, it's up in some hills. Um, it is um, using, again, all the options we had at Nika's first. So remember all the different barley types, the different fermentation times, the different yeast strains and different cast types. All the options used there are used here apart from 
no heavily peated barley. Okay, so the first distillery has unpeated, lightly peated, medium peated, and heavily peated barley. Here, there's not the heavily peated, but there's three other types. Okay, so unpeated, lightly peated, and medium peated. Okay, um, and um, all the other options used there are here. So different yeast strain, fermentation times, still settings. We'll talk about still shape in just a second. And again, lots of different cask types are used here as well. I didn't quite go into it for the first distillery because I was trying to get us through um, to taste this. But um, Tuggets here basically started using everything that was common to be used in Scotland when he was there. So obviously ex bourbon is your predominant, but also ex sherry, either Oloroso or Pedro Jimenez, also virgin American oak casks. And then they kind of came up with some categories of casks when they're reused. So a American whiskey, you know, it's come over from America having been used for bourbon. The first time you use it, you call it an ex bourbon cask. But after you have used it once for your whiskey in Japan or Scotland, then they start calling it a refill cask or a reused cask, okay? Because it kind of is irrelevant what used to be in there. Um, then after you use the cask a couple of times, you'll take off the ends and replace those with new wood, but leave the staves as old, okay? So you've got a combo of old and new wood happening in there. And there's another category called recharge. So once you've used a cask a few times, if it's still looking nice and strong, nice and sturdy, uh, you'll shave off the inside and char it. And so it'll be fresh char on old wood, which again, give you different flavors as well. So loads and loads of different cask type options, just if we're just talking about American oak and ex sherry. Now they're obviously in Japan, you hear quite a lot about Japanese oak or maybe other different things happening, uh, plum wine casks, all kinds of stuff like that. Other Japanese whiskey companies do use those. Nika don't really. Um, and that's because everything's based on what Takitsuru learned in Scotland. So if it wasn't being done in Scotland in those days, they wouldn't really do it. I'm not saying that Takitsuru have no Mizunara casks, Japanese oak casks in their warehouses. I'm sure there probably are some. They definitely had to use it uh, during the Second World War, for example, when things weren't being shipped around uh, very much. Um, and they have started releasing some finished casks in the last few years as real limited releases. Um, but if we're talking about aging, the vast majority of these whiskies, it's either um, American oak, like I say, virgin, all the way through all those different categories, or sherry. Okay, so here at Miyagikyo, they focus on the sherry casks, and you can probably smell it. Okay, so is everyone getting that rich honey, raisin, Christmas pudding, nutty um, smell coming off here? Uh, so that's coming from those Oloroso or Pedro Jimenez casks. Okay, but there is some American oak in here. And I'm not sure if anyone, when they taste a single malt, you know, from other companies quite often you will be like oh okay so what ppm is your barley and how long do you ferment for and all those kind of questions you can ask them here but i can't tell you because this miyagikyo is a single malt but made from all the different combinations that are made at miyagikyo so in here is some components that are unpeated some components that are lightly peated some components that are medium peated there are five different yeast strains used at Miyagikyo, so this will contain some of all of them. There's all those different cast types I just mentioned, all the different fermentation times, okay? So this is kind of where Japanese whiskey really differs from Scottish uh, single malt whiskey particularly, is that if you're, you know, trying to find out the specific production decisions in Scotland, they're quite often one or two options, uh, one or two answers they can give you, whereas here in Japan, because they wanted to blend, they're giving you many, many more options here, okay? But it's also one of the reasons maybe why Japanese single malts have won so many awards in the last few years, particularly is because how complex can your whiskey be if you're always using the same level, peat level in your malted barley, always using the same yeast strain, always using the same cask type and fermentation time. You're just blending some different casks together and hoping there's some roundness to the flavor. And of course, I'm not slagging off um, scotch at all. They are, make some very, very complex flavors. But how much more complex can it be if you've got different peat levels, different yeast strains, fermentation times, and cast types? There's a lot more going on here. And hopefully everyone's feeling all these layers of flavor. Okay, so tons happening here. It should be richer than the last one because obviously this is a single malt, so no grain in here at all. And it is stronger than the last one. It's 45% ABV. So sorry if anyone noticed when you sipped before I've managed to get there. I need to pause. So lots happening here in the flavor. Hopefully everyone can feel, uh, feel that. Again, real fruity honey sweetness right on the tip of the tongue, but then goes straight into quite a herbaceous flavor. Not sure if everyone's getting all this green foresty. It's a pine forest um, all the way around here. So this pine foresty notes. Um, 
And then again, tiny little hint of smoke at the bottom. You've got some lovely earthy flavors and you've got the kind of nuttiness as well from those sherry casks. So lots and lots happening. Um, now with this whiskey, and I sound a bit like, um, <laughs> like a weirdo, is I think that when you sip it, the flavors kind of go up, okay? So the flavors explode into the air like fireworks, if that makes sense, okay? So just as well, trying to put tasting notes onto this one, just as you think you've grabbed one, put your finger on it and about to give it a name, it morphs into something else. There's lots and lots changing here, millions of tiny flavor molecules all dancing around, okay? Now that is partly because of the still shape. Sorry, me again with the still shape, yeah. Um, but obviously me, Gikyo, it's a single malt, so it has to be pot stilled. Now, the one that um, they've used is here on the right. Um, and if you're interested in how stills work at all, this is a way of making a complex, elegant whiskey that like we're tasting. And so the, the spirit has to travel from the bottom down here where it's heated all the way through to the end of this line arm. Now, if you put obstacles in the way, it makes it much, much harder for the spirit to just go straight through. And it's more likely it's going to interact with other molecules flying around in the vapor um, or even recondense and fall back down to be re-evaporated, which also will create a bit more uh, kind of complexity. So this here, this bubble in the neck is um, confusing the vapor as it rises. It kind of just gives it a bit of a roundabout to go around. There's more likely to make it condense here in the neck. Um, of course, if things recondense back into liquid, they fall down to the bottom and get reheated. Um, and also see the line arm is ascending, it goes up. So if at any stage while the vapor is traveling up this line arm, if it recondenses into a liquid there, it's again, because of gravity, going to fall backwards into the pot rather than forwards into what we drink. So that means those heavy, viscous, oily molecules really struggle to get up through this still. Um, whereas what will happen is when they fall back into the heat of the still, sometimes they'll break apart. The small, more, um, more volatile components will be able to shoot straight through this still and give us a much more complex flavor. Okay, so hopefully that's making sense. If it doesn't, don't worry, because you're about to compare it to the still on the left. And the still on the left is used at Nika's other distillery. And if this whiskey points up, you'll notice that our next whiskey, the texture and flavor points down. Okay, and that's because of the shape of these stills. So don't worry if you um, don't want to be too interested in this, the tasting will hopefully uh, reveal all. And yes, um, these stills, so the Yoichi stills were kind of made, the original one was made in Japan um, from bits lying around from his designs. He did ship over uh, some of the later bits and pieces from Scotland. So it's a bit of a, a combo basically. Um, the original um, still at Yoichi actually only had one, that's all he could afford when the first few years he set up Yoichi. So to do a double distillation, he had to build, uh, to distill it through once, and then clean it out and then shove the stuff back in again. I had to distill it through that same still a second time. It's only a, a few years later they actually ended up with, with second stills. So yeah, you've got components of both coming uh, from, from Scotland um, and from Japan as well, depending on the sections, because obviously it's quite expensive to ship over, but there's certain bits that they might not have made um, uh, quite, <laughs> quite the same in Japan as they would have done in Scotland, okay? So here's some pictures here um, of them. Those stills that I showed you as the example of a pot still earlier was Niigikyo. Um, so you can see the bubble in the line arm here. One of my favorite bits actually about the stills at both Yoichi and Niigikyo is um, these uh, kind of origami like paper things tied around the neck. So they get blessed every year basically. Um, someone comes um, and uh, will kind of do a, a blessing on the stills and that is the, the specific folds and cuts of the paper there are for steam. That's the steam god here that they're appeasing, making sure the steam doesn't escape because that's the bit that we want to keep. All right, so uh, you don't see these on stills in Scotland. Okay, everyone enjoying the Miyagi Kyo? So I've not told you all the facts about it, sorry. It is 45% uh, ABV. It's 10 to 12 years old on average. Now, I'm not sure if anyone ever has been uh, into Nika for quite a few years, but you might have known the old Miyagi Kyo single malts that had some age statements. So there used to be a 10 year old, a 12 year old and a 15 year old, as well as a no age statement. Um, and the old no age statement, it's funny, was actually eight to 10 years old. And this one is 10 to 12 years old. Uh, so I think it's the only time that a no age statement whiskey has replaced um, a previous no age statement whiskey and been older. Um, but obviously what Nika had to do is consolidate. There's been a huge shortage of single malts in Japan in the past few years. And this actually is from beer. I blame beer lager. Um, because remember I told you everyone used to drink highballs or mizuaris with lunch? 
Well, that stopped in the 80s because of lager. <laughs> lager came in and became the lunchtime drink and it really messed up the whiskey industry. Suddenly sales essentially halved overnight. Um, and so obviously all the whiskey distilleries, not just Nika, but Suntory as well and some others closed um, entirely. Um, started realizing they were selling a lot less whiskey, so they started making a lot less whiskey. And it was only about nine years ago that the distilleries went back onto full-time production. Um, so for us to end up with 10, 12, 15-year-old age statements of Niagikios was, of course, coming from a real decreasing quantity of stock. So they decided to turn those four SKUs into one and use all the stock that would have gone into those in this instead. And so that's what this is, okay? Uh, so if anyone has any age statement of Niki, because sees them lying around or has any, then um, treasure them. <laughs> they are lovely. Um, any other questions or comments on Niki? Have I missed anything out? I can't remember all the facts of whiskey now. <laughs> um, uh, I feel like I'm either talked for too long or not long enough. I don't know. <laughs> or I, I've not breathed for ages. Oh, right. Okay. So everyone fine with the Migi care? Yes, I'm, I'm seeing no, um, no other questions or anything. Obviously we can come back and talk about it uh, later if you want. But I think, like I say, the useful thing will be to compare it to the next one, um, which is Yoichi. So if you fish out the bottle called Yoichi. And this is what it looks like. Thank you, brilliant work. And that's the box bottle nice nice team <laughs> um so you each <laughs> you're right Han. <laughs> i was talking earlier as well and then i realized i was muted so sorry. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, do that. Yeah. I keep thinking i'm muted i keep going well all i can hear i can hear nothing and i'm like is it still working it's okay. it's me. so um <laughs> right so i know we have talked about it an awful lot and still not tasted it or talked about it very specifically but here we go Remember Takitsuru's original distillery that he built for himself? Now, obviously, he built Yamazaki for the other guy. And then he left. And in 1934, he started building himself a distillery. And it's this one right here. Have I missed the map? Oh, okay, I'm going to go back to the map. Here we go. In fact, I'll go back up to the top. There. Yeah. So, um, you, you're right, Han? Yep. Sorry. Yep. Getting to get to it. Just check. I wasn't sure you had a question. Um, so, Yoichi is that distillery that he built in 1934. I know we've not talked about it yet very much. And it's just because the flavor of it, remember it's coastal or islandy in style. Um, so we're not going to shove it before the grain or before uh, the blends or even the Miyagi-kyo. It does taste much better right here, straight after the Miyagi-kyo. So um, he situated it um, where a river meets the sea, uh, essentially an estuary. Um, and he named it after that river, okay? So it's called the Yoichi River and the Yoichi Distillery. And there's a wee fishing village, it's now a town, uh, it's also called Yoichi right next to it as well, okay? Um, and I have a picture right here. So this is the river Yoichi, I'm running through the sort of left to center. The bit at the top is the sea to the left of the north of Japan, west, the west. Um, and um, that's the fishing town, like I said, it was a wee village, uh, when they set up the distillery, it's, it's a wee bit bigger now. And then see all those red roofed buildings towards the center and the bottom of that picture? That is the distillery there, okay? So you can see how close to the sea it is. Of course, the, the river was really handy for a water source. They actually chose the um, river because there's a peat bog upstream and they thought they were going to make their own um, peaty barley. Just FYI, they don't. <laughs> um, they do have some peat and they'll burn it at the distillery to show you what happens. Um, but uh, they realized quite quickly um, that um, malting all your own barley was a bit of a struggle, uh, getting consistent peatiness into your whiskey in the right level um, was also very difficult. And in Japan, I'm not sure if anyone knows the Japanese culture very well, but if you can't do something brilliantly, really well, then you do not do it, you get an expert instead. And so Takets, you obviously knew that in Scotland there's the malt houses, they're doing it for almost all the other distilleries anyway, so you might as well ship it over from them. Okay, so unpeated barley, um, it, the portion in the Nikas could be uh, quite like to be from Japan and malted by these guys, um, but if it's peated in any way, it will be coming from Scottish malt houses. Okay, so it'll be European barley um, and peated using very likely to be Scottish peat. Okay. Um, so that's all shipped over. But like I say, they do, they did have lovely plans at the beginning of, of digging up their own peat and giving it a go. Um, so 
like I see, obviously, all the Oichi that we taste has been aged here. So, of course, the coastal influence is really, really going to come through into those casks. This is why you, it's a bit of a difficulty to make a sort of space side Highlandy or Lowlandy style of whiskey right here because it's being aged here. So um, it's always going to have that little hint of uh, taste. Um, so, um, yes, very, very old school tradition. Remember the first one they built when they had no money? Um, and it's in 1934, so really, really traditional. Um, I'm going to show you that lovely snowy picture. If you want to go on holiday in Japan, uh, obviously there's amazing things to see in Tokyo and in the south where everyone goes. No one goes to the north, and it's amazing. So I strongly recommend uh, going up to Hokkaido. And actually, this distillery is kind of easier to get to than Miyagikyo, really. Miyagikyo, because it's on the same island, is a uh, an amazing bullet train, but then a, an hour and a half in a bus and it's windy and it's hilly and it's really, really difficult to get to. Whereas Yuichi, uh, yes, you can get um, a plane up to Sapporo um, and then you can get a train. I think someone mentioned the train distillery is uh, right, right across the road and fishing village, guys, fishing town. So sushi lunch on the way uh, is spectacular. Um, also great skiing around here as well. So just strong recommend for a holiday or any holiday, to be honest, I'd be grabbing with both hands right now. Um, so uh, the whiskey here, um, they are again using, remember making 600 options, but compared to Miyagi here using heavier peated barley, there are some unpeated Yoichi, so this possible to find, um, but generally they will be using a medium to heavy peated barley. Again, five different yeast strains here, but only three of which overlap at the ones that, with the ones at Miyagi Kyo. Generally longer fermentation times than Migiku, so getting a bit richer flavor, a bit more complexity, a bit more earthiness, um, and focusing on uh, American oak casks. So there is sherry cask in here, but it's minor, whereas in um, Migiku it was major, okay? Now, otherwise it's the same deal. It's 45% ABV and 10 to 12 years old is the majority of the liquid in here, but going from eight to kind of 15 plus essentially is your wider age range. Again, this replaced um, old Yorichi, 10, 12, 15, there was a 20 year old as well, and an old no age statement. So this single one used all of that stock together. Okay. So, ah, I think Joseph and LA have been there. Excellent. Oh, you're the ones who knew about the train as well, right? <laughs> I think I remember. Uh, so yes, uh, good. I'm glad people are, have been. It is free to visit guys. <laughs> There's no excuse. And you get a wee tasting at the end and they do now have English information when they didn't, uh, when I first went. Uh, but now there is possible to get some English information on your on your way around, um, and yeah, absolutely stunning. Okay, so again, it's a single malt, and again, this is but isn't. It could be all six hundred of the different sort of styles of whiskey made at Yuichi combined together. It's not okay. It's about hundred to one hundred and fifty ish, um, which is still a lot more. Remember, again, we're talking about that kind of complexity compared to a distillery that's just making the same recipe every day. Um, but obviously the definition of a single malt is made at one distillery. It doesn't say you have to use the same peat level every day. It doesn't say you have to use the same yeast strain every day or the same cast type every day. Okay. So they're not cheating here. Um, some people used to say that's what was happening. They're just being creative, let's say. And obviously their end goal is to make blends. And so this is the best way to do it without having to buy whiskey off your enemy. Um, so yeah, I've got a favorite here. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's like me and is usually into PT, PT fellas, but this is uh, is a beaut. Um, now, uh, sorry, 73 quid tonight, Yanis. Oh, it's a bargain. It's a bargain. Love that. Uh, so one little fun thing that I love about Yoichi, and you guys probably saw it when you visited, um, is the still room. Right, everyone can see this picture that I'm showing you, but they actually have coal fires to heat their stills. Now, this was absolutely normal and standard in Scotland when Takitsuru was there learning in 1918 to 1920. But in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, the distilleries in Scotland changed over because using coal fire, to be honest, not the best, most efficient, easy to control way to heat your still. Obviously, distilling is all about separating things out by their boiling point. So you kind of want to be able to, you know, maybe aim for a specific temperature, heat it up nice and slowly sit at a certain temperature for quite a while just to make sure every molecule of ethanol is evaporated nicely and then you know raise and lower the, the temperature up and down just to be really really thorough to the way to distill anyone ever tried to turn down a coal fire 
anyone ever tried to hold it at a specific temperature it's it's hard i'm going to suggest don't do it it's um it's not a, an easy an easy job and so the scottish distilleries all stopped using coal furnaces and actually there are now no distilleries in scotland that still use coal fired stills there are some guys that will use gas so they use direct heat um but yeah, that again you can still had him there's only three left to use direct heat Exactly. And they can turn down the gas like you can on your cooker or whatever and, you know, maintain a nice temperature if you're still, it's still a bit hard, but very careful. And obviously most people are using steam, okay, which is super easy to control. You can make it go up nice and slowly and then kind of float around all your kind of key temperatures to make sure all your molecules are evaporating off nice and nice and specifically. So yeah, juggling with rain, exactly. This is an absolute nightmare, um, but it's unusual. And obviously Takitsuru, um, Nika, people in Japan, very, very proud and, and kind of keen on tradition. Um, and of course, you know, Japan isn't a traditional whiskey making country, but the traditions that they do have for whiskey making, they are very keen to keep. And this is the type of thing that, you know, remember I said Asahi now owns Nika, if it was in an, a different country um, and, you know, a big business, international kind of successful businesses taking over a little small one. This is the type of thing that you'd 100% get, get rid of, okay? But because of that family connection, because it would be essentially like insulting Takitsuru, it'd be like implying that Takitsuru did not build this distillery in the best possible way, it will not happen. So it's, um, I, I'm assuming Miyagikyo is coal-fired as well? No, steam, 1969, all mod cons there. Right, okay. It's steam. And um, is Yamazaki... Well, yes. Yeah. So it, I, it was initially. Um, I don't know whether it is now. I don't think it is, right. but I haven't been. Um, I, <laughs> and like I say, the companies aren't um, great friends. So if I try to sneak off from a Nika trip, say, <laughs> and visit Yamazaki, <laughs> strong frowning, I think I'd get. <laughs> so I need to, I need to, yeah. I did actually manage to go and see Chichibu uh, last time. Um, kind of, well, I just, I took an extra few days holiday at the end and went to Chichibu and it was amazing, um, but I haven't seen Yamazaki. So yeah, I don't think it is, but I don't want to guarantee. I feel like Yamazaki's had a few um, upgrades since then. And again, I think with their, yeah, they weren't as focused on tradition, obviously, as Takitsuru. They don't have that link to Scotland. Uh, whereas um, Yamazaki was much more about taking um, traditional things from Takitsuri's knowledge, but mixing that with uh, the Japanese way of doing things, which would have been modern, and again, keeping costs down as well, initially in those first early years. So yeah, people who visited are saying no call. So thank you for that for that knowledge. Um, so yeah, there's dudes here shoveling coal in all day, every day to heat the stills now. It heats up real fast, as I'm sure you've all, if you've been near a coal fire, um, it heats up really fast and it gets really hot. Uh, like the stills are actually uh, between 700 and 1000 degrees C. Whereas that is massively way more than you need to distill some alcohol out of an alcohol and water mixture. Um, so yeah, it's super hot. It gets there real fast. So it's a very rustic, let's say, way of just saying. And actually, I think it gives you a really kind of rustic texture. Can everyone feel um, how this whiskey feels different from the last one? Now, remember I talked about the last one, the flavors going upwards. Okay. Does everyone feel that the flavors here kind of soak in through your cheeks, soak into your tongue, soak in through your gums? And that's because of the still shape that I talked about. So go back to that slide. Um, still here is shorter, much shorter Yoichi. It's got what's called an onion neck or kind of like a funnel. So the vapor when it's rising is just swimming gently, swimming, no, floating gently up <laughs> that um, neck. And then once it gets past the bend and into the line arm, if it gets a bit cold there and recondenses into a liquid, it's all good. It's gonna fall forward into the stuff we're collecting, the stuff we're drinking. Okay, so no obstacles at all here. All those heavy, oily, big, viscous molecules um, are just scampering straight through the still, essentially. So you get, for me, a lot less complexity. There's a lot of flavors here, but if Miyagiko to me has 600 tiny flavors, Yoichi has 20 big flavors, if that makes sense. And obviously it is still a super complex whiskey. There's loads more going on, but it's just, it's just the way it feels in the palate. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Um, so, you know, we've done pot versus column and now we're doing pot shape versus pot shape. So hopefully everyone's, everyone's okay. Um, but this coal fire thing as well does have a huge impact on the flavor as well. 
when you're distilling the wash um onto the the wash actually burns onto the bottom of the still because it's so hot uh so there's a thing called the maillard reaction which you know when you make toast when you sear a steak when you make anything delicious basically uh, you really want that reaction happening and that is super hot um fire you need to make that so you know steam produced whiskies don't get that um which is why those cold uh, there's uh, sort of a uh, gas fired ones in scotland are still sort of so prized as well um and why this is too so there's a really really kind of lovely earthy interesting flavor there's, there's a bit of a fanciful tasting note but i'm not sure if anyone else is a student like i was and really failed at the cooking um i actually burned baked beans onto the bottom of a pan like one minute they were not hot the next minute they were all burned onto the bottom and there's a slight hint of that flavor if you ever burn something really really <laughs> viciously onto the bottom of a pan particularly if it's a copper pan i'm not saying it's a major tasting note in the uhe but there's a definite tiny hint of that going on in there and that's actually really delicious a kind of flavor a flavor that humans like we like the flavor of cooked delicious things um so hopefully everyone's getting that a little bit here yeah heads towards umami kind of action definitely the saltiness here from the coast we've got the earthiness um from both the stills um obviously the the barley uh, and the, the smokiness um so lots and lots happening here to make it quite a savory whiskey um but just yeah really really lots going on but of course there is also yeah again these kind of zesty uh, lighter flavors it's not the heaviest peat you're ever going to find uh, if you're into super peaty things um japanese palate really not keen on something huge and smoky and something that's quite aggressively uh smoky um but it is um you know it's got a good solid amount of smoke in the middle here okay so all right we've got a question on the top right so just use it stills on the left are uncovered Oh no, yeah, it's just a uh, kind of glass roof type action. Uh, what's it called? Yeah, um, not a full glass roof, but just a section. Sun roof? No, sunlight? No. Conservatory? Not a conservatory, not a full glass roof, but it's a small like insect. People have them in their house if they convert their ceiling, they convert their roof space. Oh my God, here are the words today. Highlight? Uh, Skylight, thank you. That is the word. Oh my goodness. I was like, sunlight. <laughs> no. Alison, yes. Alison, the hashtag skylight. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, can everyone see that little still in the middle there? It's kind of further back. So you've got the two on the far right of the picture on the top right. So you've got two stills on the top right, then a wee one further back, and then two on the left. That wee one further back was the original. Okay, so it was it's smaller than all the others. Um, and it's, I mean, obviously they'll have replaced all the sections uh, gradually over time, but it's kind of the original uh, one in size from the 1930s. Um, and like I say, Takatsu only had one at the time. So uh, quite, quite an intense way. Um, but yes, thank you for Skylight. <laughs> uh, so the guys here, um, if you go and visit those guys in blue overall, shoveling coal in at the bottom of these stills. Um, you know, really, really, it, it kind of looks amazing. I think sometimes when you go to a distillery in Scotland, you're sometimes a wee bit disappointed by the still room because there's dudes in a different room, uh, you know, through some glass, looking at what looks like the world's oldest computer um, and just occasionally pressing buttons and that's how they're managing everything. Whereas you go here and this is how it should be. People shoveling coal <laughs> um, and twisting big copper things. It, yeah, lots happening. It's, it's really, you know, people making stuff. Um, it's great. They let me shovel the coal in uh, for quite a long time, actually. I was joked that they went for lunch. Uh, they just left me <laughs> shoveling. Um, and when they came back, I'd done it wrong, apparently, because I had just been so delighted to get my shovel of coal through the wee door, um, which isn't that big. And obviously, it's all very, very hot. Um, <laughs> I hadn't I just sort of dumped the coal right inside the door. You're supposed to throw it to the back um and you know make a nice flat bed of coal and i just made a little mountain just inside the door uh, which apparently wasn't very helpful it very much changed the flavor of the whiskey that day apparently uh so hopefully there's some special casks with my name on what I'm, I'm hoping for but yeah they really took the piss <laughs> but uh yeah they're in weebly overalls and apparently i was thinking that that was because of the shoveling so i was a bit you know I had my nice big winter coat on i was a bit worried but apparently it's because the wash burns onto the inside of the wash still every time they distill. So they have to leap in after it's all cooled down and scrub it out every time. Uh, so that's what the blue overalls are for. But they train for three years to run these stills, um, to shuffle the coal, scrub the coal out and, and you know, turn the big copper wheels and, and, and valves and stuff. It's um, yeah, very big, amazing job. So 
very cool, worth seeing, bit of history. And like I say, there's no distilleries in Scotland doing it this way anymore. So um, yeah, very, very cool. I, I heard a few years ago, there was someone planning to build one that was going to be coal fired in Scotland. And I was going to joke that, you know, they're probably going to get three months into it and be like, wow, this is hard and expensive. And I mean, obviously not great for the environment. Let's not <laughs> mess around. Um, but it's tradition. OK, so it's, um, it's very important. The, the coal comes from Russia, just across the water. Um, if anyone needed to know that question. Um, right, how are we getting on with the Yuichi then? Any other tasting notes? Any questions? Um, Yuichi is an absolute stunner. Um, and I think it's the most well-known of the Nika single malts, partly because of the word is much easier to say than the Igikyo. Um, and it was also the first Japanese whiskey to ever win best single malt in the world uh, in 2001. Um, it won best single malt uh, at a huge whiskey tasting um, and was published. It was the first, like I say, first Japanese whiskey to do this. So suddenly everyone in the whiskey industry and kind of the whiskey geeks in Europe were like, what? Where? <laughs> Who? Um, they knew Japan would be making sort of whiskey. They weren't really sure of the quality or the, the you know, production processes of it for quite a while. Um, but this really is when 2001 is really when Japanese whiskey really started sort of changing making a little bit of a dent obviously it was just a whiskey industry first that noticed and then that's got bigger and bigger and bigger in all the years since then uh so particularly the last sort of seven eight years on one of your slides steph it said um why it was called yuichi yeah the yuichi river um and oh no no, no sorry not yuichi nika what it was ah, nika yes yeah, sorry i did skip past that slide so remember when they were making um Fruit juices, apple juice, pear juice, plum juice. The name of the company from 1934 up until the 1950s, actually, was Dai Nippon Kaju Kabushiki, which roughly translates to the Great Japanese Juice Company. My pronunciation is probably bad, just in case anyone speaks Japanese. Um, but they were the Great Japanese Juice Company, um, and they were very successful. And actually so successful, they didn't change the name to Nika, and then Ni from, came from Nippon, and the Ka came from Kaju Kab Kabushiki, which is the other part of the, the original name. Okay, so that's where Nika came from. It's a, um, I used to say a Brangelina, but now I can't. Um, it's a smooshed together of all those other words uh, to make Nika. So it doesn't really mean anything in Japanese itself as a brand name, but it was just a shortening of the longer name for the juice company. And they only renamed the company when whiskey sales overtook the fruit juice sales. So releasing their whiskey in 1940, 1952, they changed that name. So Juice Company accidentally really successful. I mean, they wanted it to make money for them to build a distillery, but I don't think they really thought it would keep going for such a long time. They still make cider. Uh, they made cider before they got the stills in when they were just had the fermenters. Um, so they still make cider. If you go and visit Yoichi, you can get some cider up there as well. There's a blue can or a red can. One is sweet, one is dry. We buy all of them and we drink them in the bus on the way home. Never knew that. That's really cool. There you go. They also still make apple brandy and it's called Rita, named after her. It was her favourite. Only comes out really occasionally. We pretty much never get it to the UK. And it's usually, you know, a 30 year old, a 40 year old, a 50 year old, some kind of anniversary of something. OK, so occasionally we'll get some apple brandy, but not very often. All right. When is some, what are some new releases coming out? Well, very good question. We are about to launch into two new products that have just arrived in the UK. Uh, God, what year is it? What is happening? My time continuum has all gone <laughs> in all directions. These came out last year, but quite late last year. I'm going to say like October. Yes, we got them October, September, October is last year. OK, so the next two whiskies are new. Uh, so hopefully that is exciting for everyone. Everyone ready? Um, and sorry. Just win there. Um, Nico from the Barrel is your favourite. I'm afraid we're not tasting that one today. Um, <laughs> hopefully, it being your favourite, you have tried it before. But one of the new ones that's come out is Nico from the Barrel's Big Brother. Um, so actually, I'll show you a bottle of Nico from the Barrel for those of you who don't know it. It's this one. So now that you've seen it, you're probably like, oh yeah, I do know that one. Um, it's an absolute beauty. It's actually biggest selling Japanese whiskey in Europe. So huge success. And it's a combination of Nika Coffee Grain, Miyagikyo, and Yoichi. Those are the three things that go into it. Okay, so we've just tasted them. All right. Imagine you could try and blend some yourself. 
if you've got any samples left, probably not. <laughs> um, but obviously it's a little bit more complex that because remember both Migikyo and Yorichi have 600 options and we've not tasted all 600 of them, okay? Um, it's not lethal, it's just a 51.4%, which I think is a perfectly reasonable percentage uh, for it to be. <laughs> yes. Okay, so one of the new ones we're about to taste, well, we should grab it now. It's called Nika Tailored, okay? And this one is, as I say, Nika from the Barrels Big Brother, okay? Um, and it was released last year. Um, and... It is a blended whiskey. So we obviously tasted Nika days earlier and that's more, you know, not daytime drinking, but Tuesday night drinking, drinking with buddies, having a relaxing time. This one is very much more kind of after dinner, big glass, big chair, have a little chat with him. Okay. Have a big chat with him. He's got a lot to say. Okay. So it is a combination of, um, and the interesting thing actually is Nika from the barrel is 60% grain, 40% malts. This is the other way around. Okay. This is 40% grain and 60% malts. Now in a blended whiskey, that's super unusual. Okay. Your grain is usually by far the biggest component, sometimes 85, sometimes even 90%, depending on the whiskey that we are talking about. Okay. So to have a predominantly malt blended whiskey is very, very unusual. Okay. And if you are a single malt snob, this is probably one of the few blends that's going to be a bit suitable for you because the flavor intensity is still there, as well as having the extra complexity from having a couple of different distilleries together. So again, this is we've tasted the components of this. We've tasted coffee grain, we've tasted Megi Kyo, and we've tasted Yoichi. That's the three things that are going in here. Okay. Um, and like I say, just 40% grain. So it should be lighter than the Yuichi we've just tasted. And when I actually first tasted this, I was with the master blender. I skipped past the picture of him, he's just here. This is um, Tadashi Sukuma or Sukuma-san. He is the chief blender of Nika. Um, now Takitsuri passed away in the 1970s and he passed his title of master blender onto his son, Takitsuri Jr. Um, he passed away about eight, nine years ago. And uh, so Tadashi Sukuma, Took over then. Now, Nika have always said that they will not give anyone else the title of Master Blender. Uh, since then, um, because of the Takit series, the highest up you can be in the company is Chief Blender, which is what it actually says in it. Um, and he's lovely. He comes across the UK occasionally, does sort of whiskey shows and occasional tasting. Obviously, it's been a wee while since we've seen him now. Um, but there's a whole team of blenders. There's a few junior blenders that are all working their way up to being senior blender. And then there are uh, three or four, three other senior blenders apart from him. And the plan is, I think, that they would take turns to be chief blender, to make sure no one gets burnout. Because the guy who's chief blender is not only responsible for everyone else, but also has to do the traveling and the talks and the master classes, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a bit of a heavier job. Okay. So this one is 43% ABV. Okay. And the vast majority of the whiskey in here is, well, it's a weird one actually, because it was just released and um, the, it released something to replace something called Nika 12. I'm not sure if anyone's seen the Nika 12 before. It's the same bottle shape as that one. Now, obviously remember what I said earlier about the predominant amount of liquid we've got, right? From Nika, we've got tons of liquid age nine and younger. And then we've got quite a lot of liquid that's kind of 18 plus. <laughs> so, making a 12 year old release was really, really difficult because the 12 year old to 15 year old stuff was, was in real short supply. So that's what we've done here. They replaced the 12 year old with stuff that combines that younger uh, seven, eight, nine year old whis whiskey with that much, much older whiskey. And they are aiming for that flavor profile of the old 12 year old. And I mean, I actually think I prefer it. Which I'm, it's really, really interesting. The extra complexity from the super old stuff that's going in here. Um, is absolutely incredible. But obviously you get quite a lot of vibrancy from the young stuff. And I love a young peaty whiskey, personally. And I quite often think, because peat dissipates as you age it. So I think what's the point in peating something heavily and then aging it for bloody ages? Um, you're just gonna lose all your smokiness. So I always get a nice zingy um, peatiness here, okay? So um, yeah, obviously have a little explore of this. And then when I first tasted this, I tasted it like we've just done now, straight after Yoichi with Tadashi Sukuma and I'm like, what is this man doing? He doesn't know what he's doing at all. You don't put a blend after a big, powerful, smoky, peaty malt like Yoichi 
rustic as we called it yeah um you don't put a blend after that it's just going to be light it's going to be lost this is not the correct tasting order what what a silly man um and then I taste it and I'm like, oh yeah, no, you can see why she's blender actually. He does, he doesn't exactly hundred percent know what he's doing. All right. So like I say, it would be quite an unusual tasting order for someone to put a blend after a malt like Yoichi. Okay. But hopefully everyone can notice that this one really stands up. Okay, you've got a lot of flavor coming out here. Um, and again, it's all about these layers. It's, it's lots and lots happening. So look out for the components that we've tasted. Obviously, we've just tasted Yoichi, so the smoky, oily, earthy saltiness. Um, Migi Kia, remember, was fruity, floral, it was honeyed, it was herbaceous. I remember the coffee grain, coconut, butter, uh, tropical fruits, and that texture, okay? So remember, also Migi Kia up texture, Yoichi down texture. Um, so we've got everything happening. This is £100 a night, Ryan, which is a brilliant price for it. That is a brilliant price. So usually 120 plus, right? As, yeah. Yeah. At, le at least 110, I think. Yeah. Um, so really, really lovely. Lots happening in here. And as you can see, totally does stand up after the Uichi. Um, It takes a little while for the smoky flavors to come through after the Uichi, but it takes a couple of sips for that to happen. But loads and loads and loads going on. Now it's called tailored um, because of the kind of link to layering um, and sort of clothing almost. So the bottle shape, I'm not sure if anyone has seen that. Sorry, I'm trying to hold my glasses. Um, right, so the bottle shape here, um, everyone can see this little sort of thing across here. So when they designed this bottle shape, it was actually all about traditional Japanese clothing, the kimono. Um, and if you were going to a big special event uh, in Japan, you would wear all your kimonos. That sounds a bit weird. But basically, you would show your wealth, you'd show your success by how many different silks, colors, patterns you could afford. OK, so you'd put on a lower kimono, then another one around that, then another one around that. And they would all be you'd be able to see all the edges of all of them um, just in the neckline here where they crossed over. OK, so that was layering. OK, and that's kind of what this is about, all those different flavors together. Now, this bottle shape links to that as well. Now, when I first, my first trip to Japan, um, they actually did a special, really fancy dinner for us. We were in an onsen, um, like a, a spa hotel. Um, and then they laid out a kimono for us all in some little uh, shoes. Um, and they were really taken to a sort of dinner in this hotel with millions of tiny plates, millions of molecules of food, basically, uh, all served one at a time. And um, I strolled out of the changing room. I was one of the only girls on the trip. And I had put on my kimono, just like I put on my dressing gown and like I put on kind of my coat. And I had done right over left, um, which in a few boys, that's not how you would do it because you would probably go like your clothes go, but our lady, lady clothes, uh, we go right over left. Um, and I just did that. Now everyone was horrified. And I thought I had had some kind of, uh, yeah, what's it, wardrobe <laughs> malfunction. Um, I had not, um, but what I had done is right over left kimono is deaf kimono. You wear that to funerals um, and anyone who sees you when you have worn it uh, on a normal day is, is death to them as well. So death to everyone, <laughs> really bad idea, deaf kimono. Um, so I was very quickly instructed to go left over right, which like I say, um, for most people would be quite a lot, of, for men, that would be the normal way to put it. Um, and that is normal day-to-day -day kimono wearing. So just if you ever are in Japan and you plan to wear a kimono, please go left over right, unless you're going to a funeral. This bottle will help you remember, because if you imagine you are the bottle and your head is this cork, this is going left over right. So this is the only way I can remember um, is by holding this bottle up and imagining I'm inside. Okay, uh, so how to not make a massive cultural faux pas. It's a really cool bottle as well, really chunky. Yeah, it's hefty. Some yeah. of that hundred quid is definitely going in here. Yeah, yeah. It's a really <laughs> cool bottle. Yeah. Yeah. Nice big. It's not common to get a Japanese whiskey with a cork. It they very mostly are screw tops. There is a lot of different cork types over there. There's different health and safety laws for Japan. Um, and those laws do not merge nicely with European or American laws of what cork is food safe or is not food safe or what coating on a cork is or is not food safe. It's a big kerfuffle to um, to uh, to do a cork in a Japanese whiskey. So the rest of the range are all screw caps. 
Um, most of the other Japanese whiskies are screw caps. Um, but yes, again, a cork, extra, extra faff, but nice, it's a nice cork. Um, so goes left over right. Yes, exactly. Um, well, and you're a man, so your clothes are all left over right because it was for tailors. You were supposed to have a man dressing you if he was right-handed. He'd go left over right, which would be right to left for him. So he'd be able to easily do up your buttons. Whereas ladies, our tailors had to do it from behind, but our servants were less important than yours, I think, of course. So it's a the whole traditional dress thing. But yes. Um, so yes. Everyone okay with the Nika tailored? Hopefully everyone's enjoying it. And hopefully you can see what I mean about getting a big glass and a big chair and just really having a post-dinner, you know, heading towards the end of the evening. I mean, that huge, vast amount of time for me between dinner and bedtime. <laughs> I have to like, well, what shall I do? Okay. Um, so this one is an absolute beauty for that. It's got a lot of stories to tell, a lot of flavor um, coming through um, and really want to get to know. So hopefully, and people see the difference between that and Nika Days. Of course, blends are not all one thing. And even if you're making them from the same components, basically, um, you can have hugely different flavor profiles and kind of vibes about the liquid that you end up with. All right. Any questions? No? All good? Okay, so now we're going to move on to our last one of the evening. And this is another new one. You guys, I know. So exciting. Um, so, and again, for those of you who knew the old Nika range, you'll have met this one's predecessor as well. So obviously, I've talked quite a long time about a guy called Takitsuru. Um, he is the founder of Nika and also the father of Japanese whiskey. Um, and his son, so remember, he passed away in the 1970s. I think I just mentioned it. And his son became master blender after him. It's actually a bit of a shame because Takitsuri built Miyagi here in 1969, passed away in the 1970s. So getting a chance to do any blends, including Miyagi here, he kind of missed it. Okay. But he built it for, you know, the future generation to be able to then continue um, with the work. So he taught the son. It wasn't his actual son. Him and Rita didn't have any kids. They were worried about kind of um, how they'd be treated. Um, as a mixed race child so they um, did what's quite common in Japan if you're a childless couple you want someone to pray for you after you die a descendant to pray for you uh, when you die and so what you will do is you'll adopt someone and quite often they're adults so if you just have a nice like junior guy at work and you think he's really hard worker you'll be like cool I'll adopt you um, but what Takitsuru and Rita did is his um, what's most common actually is you'll adopt someone kind of vaguely related to you um, so uh, Takitsuru's brothers and sisters had a bunch of kids um, and it, they had, I mean, an extra, a spare, I don't know, uh, nephew and niece. So he adopted, sorry, I didn't mean that to come out wrong, but um, yes, <laughs> that did come out wrong. Yeah, um, I'm the spare. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm four. Um, ah, no, I'm first. So. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, so there was a, and actually, it, there's also kind of a bit of, you know, his er, his family originally lived in Hiroshima. And when Takitsuya comes back from um, Scotland, obviously, and then it's the Second World War. And at the end of the Second World War, that's when he adopts two nieces and nephew, uh, a niece and a nephew, who were still based in Hiroshima. So obviously getting them out of that, let's say, wholly contaminated area. I don't know if that's the word to use, but, um, you know, who knew, who knew how safe it was around there? So if you're going to sort of um, take some nieces and nephews from that southern area and move them up into the very north of Japan, uh, where they can learn all that whiskey making from you. So Takitsuri, the son, um, did this. Um, and he was quite old. I think he was, I think, definitely in his teens uh, when they adopted him. Um, but he became Master Blender after Takitsuri passed away. And he's the one who actually got to play with the Miyagikyo by the time it was aged. And so um, he released, um, as one of the things that he put together, in honor of his father was a range called Takitsuru. Okay, so there was a 12 year old, a 17 year old, a 21 year old and a 25 year old. Then the 12 year old was discontinued and replaced with a no age statement. And then that no age statement has now been replaced with this no age statement. So it's a whole big kerfuffle. But basically when Takitsuru Jr. blended it in honor of his father, it was predominantly Yuichi because that's what he had more stocks of, particularly the older stocks in there. And it was a little bit of Miyagikyo. Now, when those kind of gradual blending changes happen through the next kind of few years and few phases of development of that whiskey, it actually went quite far away from the original Takitsuru flavor profile. It went much more Miyagikyo heavy. Um, 
and the Valens changed me, but it was more focused on sherry cask. It was delicious, um, but it was quite far away from the original thing that Takitsuri Gen Jr. Bl blended in honor of his father. And so this one that replaces, again, all those other age statements, because all of them have been discontinued, and again, contains the whiskey that would have gone into those, um, is now back to that slightly more, it's still predominantly Migiko, but the Yuichi is rather than just a little splosh, it's a, a proper solid, you know, a double digit percentage, essentially, um, which it didn't used to be. So taking it back to its old flavor profile. I'm sorry, I haven't for clutching my tailored. Um, so this is what it looks like. So you might remember the old bottle. Um, it was black with gold writing. It was my favorite label. It's now not that. Um, and I'm fine with it. It looks it looks fine alongside the Yuichi and Miyagikyo. I did love the old um, black and gold one. Um, and it's still 43%. And again, it is obviously a combination of, again, kind of like the tailored. You've got some young whiskey in here. You've got eight-year-old. But you also then have kind of, you know, uh, well, 25-year-old definitely uh, in here as well. Obviously a tiny drizzle, but um, that's what they're using to uh, to make this one now. Um, and a lot more Yuichi and slightly less heavy on the sherry cask, although still predominantly Migi here and sherry cask. Mark, yes, we will see age statements in the future. Um, I'm not going to promise a year <laughs> whenever anything is coming out uh, from any whiskey company I've ever worked with. Uh, any predicted date of anything arriving has always been a massive, massive, um, yeah, 100 year anniversary. I'm not sure how much Nika are going to celebrate that because it's really Suntory's anniversary. And then 34, so 2034 could be Nika's 100th anniversary. Obviously, then there's 24, so that'll be 90th anniversary. They did do some stuff, especially releases for the 80th anniversary. Um, there might be some special things for Takitsuri arriving that, you know, they did some things for um, Takitsuri and Rita's 100th wedding anniversary last year. <laughs> no, you well, don't you dare. Um, but um, yes, so I don't think it'll take that long. I don't think we'll wait for the 100th Nika anniversary. I don't know whether they do it on the 100th anniversary of Suntory just to make sure they didn't accidentally celebrate that. Um, <laughs> whether they will, they might be becoming more friends. I'm not sure anyone's been following Japanese whiskey um, things news but there's a lot of kerfuffle at the moment because there's not really many laws about what a whiskey needs to be when it's made in japan uh, so if you go to japan and drink a whiskey it could be still whiskey as the stuff i described at the beginning which is random distillate with some coloring and flavoring and the word whiskey on the front that is still 100 percent legal in japan now for it to be shipped to the uk or to europe it has to follow our laws uh, for what whiskey means, for what single malt means, for what etc cetera, etc cetera means, uh, grain whiskey etc. So um, we know that this stuff is all whiskey, um, but if you go to Japan and drink, you know, canned highball, <laughs> very unlikely to be real nice whiskey. That was where the headaches come from. Okay, so they have been talking about making some laws about what a Japanese whiskey needs to be. Also, there's a lot of companies in Japan. Obviously, it's been a huge craze for Japanese whiskey, particularly where there's been a shortage at Nikka. Um, to, you know, make fake Japanese whiskey. So ship over some cheap scotch, maybe, although scotch in Japan is still so in demand that you'd always make more money for it over there, selling it as scotch than you would do <laughs> turning it into Japanese whiskey and, and selling it that way. But it does happen. Uh, the trend has been that big, particularly in Europe. Um, quite often Canadian whiskey, uh, quite uh, very affordable. Um, and shipping that over, bottling it in Japan, calling it Japanese um, all kinds of stuff is happening. Um, companies get accused of it all the time. I mean, Nick and Suntory are relatively uh, sort of clear of those accusations. People still try and tell me that Nika uh, from the barrel has Ben Nevis in it, which there's definitely not enough being made and it's all being shipped over to Japan to be sold as scotch. Um, so there's all kinds of sort of chatter. There's some other companies do it. Some of them are very open about it. Some of them aren't open about it at all, but you can tell because you don't, you know, you, you know all the list of Japanese distilleries and it's not on there. So you're like, well, where are you getting your liquid from? And the distilleries don't often sell too much bulk to each other like happens in Scotland. So there's a lot of stuff happening um, and brands coming out, uh, jumping on this sort of Japanese bandwagon. So, I mean, Nika, obviously, if it was doing it in huge quantities, why would it have discontinued all that stuff? It's completely upended its business in the last 10 years. And I've been with them for six and a half, seven years um, you know, you'd have just kept all those old 
really successful products going if you could just shove in some scotch where you wanted. Nika did have one uh, whiskey that did used to contain some scotch and they told us about it. They were very open about it. It's called Pure Malt White um, and it contains some Isla. Uh, so no Ben Nevis either. Um, but they discontinued that. And again, I think that was because when Suntory took over, uh, suddenly owned two Isla distilleries. And I think maybe the source of that was, um, had been one of those distilleries. So there's a whole big thing that's been happening about these shortages and about what's going on and for how I got into this. Uh, discussion but um age statements are apparently coming i'm gonna say two to five years but that's not great is it <laughs> it's quite a wide range range so no specific things other new releases they i've started doing the, the last four years they've had in the autumn a teeny tiny quantity of yuichi and migi cure finished in something so it started off with i think you know sherry and uh, something else and then there was a rum and there was a bourbon um, there was a sherry one year. Last year was the apple brandy because that was Takitsura and Rita's 100th anniversary of them being married. So they did um, Yuichi and Migi here, both finished in Rita apple brandy barrels. Uh, so that was kind of a lovely romantic thing. I never got to taste them because we got about four bottles, um, I think, for the UK. Um, so I don't know what's coming out this year. I'd expect there to be something else along those lines, though, too. But other than that, no new releases that we know of, for sure. Um, and if the age statements come quicker than I say, then all the good. But it's definitely being worked on, though. Does that help? I'm not sure if I answered, uh, maybe answered a thousand questions then? <laughs> None of which were asked. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. That was really cool. How's everyone getting on with the tacket Siru? So it's 43%. Um, and I told you the age range. So it's a bit of a, it's like the tailor. So some younger and some older. Um, Liter bottles. I have never seen liter bottles of any of these products. They do come in 750s for the US market. Um, there used to be for the 80th anniversary, there was a three liter bottle of Nika from the barrel. George, have you seen one of those? I feel like yeah, they had it on the bar of Milroy's. I think they yeah. Got, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. People, I mean, you wouldn't throw that away, right? You fill that up. Yeah. Um, keep, keep it going. Um, it our infinity bottle, but it never got yeah. particularly full. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't bother having an infinity bottle at the Soho Whiskey Club. I just drink it all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, litre bottles, I don't know. There might be some sort of duty-free style things. If you do go, take my advice, go to Japan and visit the distillery or just visit Japan as a whole. In Tokyo Airport, on the way out, um, there are, uh, Nika have a blend uh, that's a Japanese only when not exported. Like I say, it might have contents that I'm going to say are not most whiskey-ish of whiskeys um that but it comes with a samurai head and it's like a metal thing on the top and there's different designs and it's about 35 quid um and when you buy the try and buy them in the uk yes thank you brandon's got one i'm not sure if everyone can see him but brandon has one i don't want to ask how much you paid for yours or did you get it in japan because if you bought it in the uk you probably paid quite a lot for it and they are not that expensive in japan well done uh, yes. Um, so whenever I always have, I the first time I came back from Japan, I had 21 bottles of whiskey in my suitcase and then I bought four of those at the airport and it was a very uncomfortable journey home. But yeah, <laughs> <it was> fun. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. Head to Japan. So those, I mean, they say those samurai heads are going to be discontinued <laughs> every time I speak to them about them and then they never are because I think they just couldn't. Um, but it's a whiskey called Golden Gold. It's not the greatest tasting. If you want to see hilarious uh, whiskey advert and the Japanese whiskey adverts, it was essentially an arms race between Nika and Suntory in the old days. Um, and who can get um, the most kind of, obviously for them, using someone Japanese, boring. Using someone Western, uh, exciting, cool, well done. Using someone Scottish, that is the top of the whiskey advertising pile. So if you think of the 1980s, the Scottish people who were your options. You've got Sean Connery, obviously. So Suntory have them because they're the bigger company with the more money. Anyone else Scottish 1980s that we could use for a nice, um, a, a nice uh, whiskey advert? Rod Stewart um, was a beauty uh, that Nika had. Uh, so slightly beer list Scottish person born in London. Um, but Nika also had Orson Welles and it's an amazing advert. You can see that in, um, in thing. And yes, Lost in Translation. I'm sorry, I've talked for too long now, I think. I don't know what the time is. But sorry if anyone has to go. Hopefully you've all enjoyed the whiskeys and I will try and stop now. Ask me any questions. 
<laughs> no, not Mel Gibson. He did not um, pass the, but there's also Sammy Davis Jr. did a great Suntory one. That's one of the best booze adverts I've ever seen. Oh, that's so, an amazing advert. Yeah, but Orson Welles is just bellowing words about, I don't know, it's not about whiskey. I don't know what he's talking about. He's hammered. Um, and I think the Japanese people like directing him, which is like, sure, cut. He took a sip halfway through, big cigar, you know, uh, being Orson Welles. So it was amazing. <laughs> um, this has been absolutely fantastic. Has anybody got any questions for Steph before we go? So yeah, Bill Murray, Lost in Translation, someone's mentioned. So yeah, absolutely great. Uh, obviously that's Suntory that they're advertising, but um, you know. Suntory time. Yeah, cool. Uh, um, <laughs> so yeah, that was just, that was incredible. Thank you, my darling. Um, so lovely to see you again. Um, and did you have a price for the last one? I don't know whether yes, I know how 50, much this is. 55 quid online. Isn't it? So you just log into um, your online tasting um, membership areas and all of these are online now. You can buy them. You can either leave them and uh, come and pick them up when we're back open or I can send them to you. Wow. Um, Steph, that was that was incredible. I have learned so much from that. Oh, thank you, Anna. So no, you've no, heard me do it so many times. When you come to the club, I'm running around doing stuff. So it was really, really <laughs> yeah. cool to actually just be able to sit down and listen and learn so many new things. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Such a lovely group of people. And I've been very much enjoying everyone's backgrounds. I'm hoping some of you are not actually on those beaches, else I might have to murder you. Um, but some of the beaches I can see, I'm like extremely jealous. Um, and some other lovely backgrounds happening as well. Someone's got, someone's got you each in. Well done. Um, so, yes. Uh, some nice salutes. is on the Titanic. Got <laughs> um, Mars at a distillery. My holidays, so uh, unfortunately, it's not where I am now, but that's where I was last <laughs> summer. Yeah, um, if you um, if you look at the um, price of having to quarantine now, um, but what better way to quarantine with some brilliant um, Nika whiskies? Exactly. And, exactly. Uh, and two that I've never tried before. Well, actually, I have. That's a lie. But um, <laughs> two that have never been in a tasting before with us. So thank you very, very much, Steph. It was really, really cool. My pleasure. It was lovely, lovely to, lovely to be chatting to everyone. And, you know, doing these sporadically now, but still getting used to it. So yeah, it's fun. Could um, everybody please unmute themselves and give Steph a fantastic um, and very warm round of applause, please. Oh, my least favorite part. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Come by. Thank you. <laughs> that was really lovely. Thank you, Steph. Thank you very much, Steph. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Thank you all for coming, and thank you so much, thank George, you. for everything, for organising all the bottling. Very good, good work on the bottling. Sending out. Um, yeah, I really hope uh, hope to see you in the club soon. Oh, uh, Papa, I can dance. That's all right. The instant. The instant it opens, I'm down there. <laughs> Perfect. All the best. Thank you so much, Steph. Cheers, guys. Bye. Cheers, guys.